This is Jack Carr checking in in the second of two videos. First one was writing advice. And I get a lot of questions asking for advice. So I uh, did a little video about that. And then I also get a lot of questions on the social channels about my writing process. So I'm just going to run through my writing process quickly and uh, pass along that. And of course, that is just my process. It's not every author's process and it might not be what works for you. But then again, Part of it might be, one of the things might be, so just passing this along in the the off chance that it might help you with your process. So um, how do I do it? Well, starting with an idea. So for that first book, I wrote down about seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different ideas, one page executive summaries. And I put those all on a table and it was very clear to me that the terminal list was the one to start with. I really wanted to start with Savage Sun, which is the third novel in the series, but it was very clear that right out of the gate, uh, the characters needed to be introduced in something that was hard hitting, that was visceral, that was primal. Uh, and that was the terminal list. And even at the end of that one, they weren't quite ready. Those characters weren't quite developed and at the stage where I could explore the themes that I wanted to explore in Savage Sun. So I needed to take James Reese on a journey of redemption, violent redemption in True Believer first, and then came Savage Sun. So some of those ideas I'm still working with, and those are becoming other novels in the series. But uh, point being, an idea. That's the uh, the first thing. And then I like a title right out of the gate too. So I'm not wasting any bandwidth, worried about a title as I'm writing, even if it's a working title, just having something in place. So it's not just book six. There's an actual title there, even knowing that I might change it later down the line. So I like to have that. So I'm not wasting any bandwidth, worried about figuring out a good title. Uh, then I write a one page executive summary. And if it's one of those ones that I wrote down all those years ago, I'll be morphing it, editing it. But the important thing is to write a one page and that could be a paragraph. It could be two paragraphs, three paragraphs. And for me, it's something like it, like the back of the book. Like if I read this, would I want to buy it and read this book? Is it intriguing enough to be, uh, as a reader, to want to spend time in these pages, knowing that I'm never going to get that time back. And that's why I pour so much of myself into these because readers have trusted me with that time. And that time is something they'll never get back. So everything, all of me goes into these books, all of my heart and soul. So that one page executive summary, something similar that, that you'd find on the back of a book, or if it's a hardcover and the, uh, the cover jacket right there. But, uh, but I write that down. And also David Morrell does something similar and he writes a letter to himself. And I thought that was great advice. You can go to davidmorell.net. And of course, David Morell created Rambo with First Blood back in 1972. He's the author of The Brotherhood of the Rose. He's been on the podcast twice. Uh, just an amazing guy. Uh, he was a mentor to me before he even knew that he was a mentor to me, reading all those books growing up. So what he does is he writes himself a letter and he asks himself, is this worth the next year, two years? three years of my life. Uh, and I do something similar with that one page executive summary. When I read it, I say, oh, is this worth the next year of my life? Because my, my books are one a year. So uh, if the answer to that is, uh, is yes, um, well, I ask two questions, actually. Uh, is this worth a year of my life? And if someone were to read this one page executive summary, would they be willing to invest the time in these pages? And if the answer to both of those is yes, then bam, that's the next novel. Um, so the idea, the title, a one page executive summary, and then I turn that one page executive summary into an outline. And typically, not all the time, but typically that is a, a prologue that is three parts and an epilogue. It hasn't been that way for every novel, but that's the way that uh, it's shaping up for book six that I'm working on right now. Uh, and has had, it's been that way for most of the other novels as well. So I write that outline uh, so I know where I'm going. And some authors don't. Some authors, they're called pantsers. And that means they write by, write by the seat of their pants and they just write. They don't know where it's going. I like to know where I'm going, even if that's going to morph slightly as I develop these characters and further develop the plot as I write. Uh, so I like to have that outline and I get it. Uh, and this is the subjective part. I get it to about, uh, well, as, as robust as is necessary to then start the manuscript. And that'll be different 
for everybody. Some people that'll be 5,000 words, some will be 10,000, some it could be 30,000, 40,000, who knows. Um, but a book in the thriller genre is typically uh, just over 100,000 words, 115,000 words, 120,000 words, somewhere in there if you're looking at, at word count. Uh, not all of them, but uh, typically right around there, it's a little over 100,000 words. So that uh, I turn, take, get that outline to a place where I'm, where I'm good with it, where, okay, I know what needs to happen in the first part, know what needs to happen in the second part, know what needs to happen in that third part, and then oh, how I'm going to wrap this up where it gives the reader enough resolution, but also makes them wonder where it's going next. So that's the, uh, that's the outline. Then I sit down and turn that outline into the manuscript, and that can take, uh, well, it depends on how many interruptions there are. That's the other part of when you sit down to write, finding a place, for me anyway, where I'm not going to be interrupted or I'm going to minor- minimize those interruptions as much as I possibly can. Uh, so sometimes I'll get up in the morning and then I'll write late into the evening, no breaks at all. Other times there's interviews to do, there's podcasts, there's other things that come up and there's life. Uh, there's taking the kids to school, there's picking them up, there's taking them to, uh, to after school activities, picking them up from from those. Uh, there's all those sorts of things uh, as well that need to get, need to get factored in. So um, how long does it take? It takes a year and it has to take a year because there's a publication date and, uh, and it's one novel a year in the James Reese series. So, um, uh, so I start writing that manuscript and I always have my books nearby for reference. And I do that because I don't yet have a notebook where I can flip to someone like a uh, director of the CIA. Okay. What color eyes did they have? Where did they go to school? That sort of a thing. So eventually I'd like to like to have that. I need to figure out that. Um, so once you get past maybe, two books or three books in the same series with a lot of recurring characters. Um, it's probably a good idea to have a notebook that has those things in there. I do not have that yet. Uh, Mark Graney, author of the Gray Man series, gave me a good idea that I just took for this book that I'm writing right now, and that's getting all the novels combined into one PDF. So you can search one PDF that contains all of the novels uh, to do a search for a keyword or a character or something like that, rather than having different PDFs if you're doing your searches electronically. But typically I have the books close by. I start, that gets a lot harder. Like if you're Lee Child or, or somebody like that who has a stack of books, well, probably this high, um, then it gets a little harder, I would think. But right now it's still semi-manageable with the number of books that I have working on on book six. So I go to these and I can flip through them for reference. Uh, I can go sometimes just want to remember writing a passage like uh, in this one right here. So this is In the Blood that came out last year. This is, just came out in paperback. And I'll go to this one every now and again uh, lately and read chapter three. Chapter three, for whatever reason, is my favorite chapter that I've ever that I've ever written. So yeah, right here. And that's my favorite, favorite one for whatever reason. But anyway, uh, and also in the back of this one, available now, uh, is the prologue to Only the Dead to my book six. So uh, prologue is in here for those that are interested in that paperback edition. But point being, I have all the books close by as I write so I can reference something fairly, fairly easily. Um, and what else do I do here? All the books I use for research. So as I go along and I do research, I'll pick up different books along the way. I have those on a separate shelf, uh, one to keep them organized. Um, and so I know right where, where to go and two. So when it's all said and done and I can do a reading list that, uh, are recommended books, uh, that help for the research of said novel. So I have an empty shelf, start the, uh, I start the year with an empty shelf right there and I start adding books to that as I do research throughout the year as I write the novel. So um, I have those close by as well. I have the Vickers Guides close by. Those are uh, my first stop when it comes to describing different weapon systems in the novels. I go to those amazing pictures, incredible descriptions. I'll do a little more research online. Uh, and then I'll ask a, a series of people, James Rupley, Larry Vickers, uh, Kyle Lamb. I'll send it to them, Clint Smith and say, Hey, does this, uh, uh, does this sound right? Did I get this operating system right on this, uh, certain weapon system and uh, bounce it off then just to make sure that that stuff is right. If it's something that I'm not intimately familiar with, uh, dictionary and thesaurus rather than just relying on what's online and some definitions have changed over the years. Uh, I have this, this is from sixth grade. You can tell it's quite worn and I need to go and find another one. I probably just need to go on eBay 
and get one that uh, is in, in good shape so I don't totally destroy this one. But this is still the one that I use today. Uh, I have other dictionaries, big you know, leather bound ones, whatever. But for some reason, I just keep going back to this one. It's super handy. Throw it in my backpack. If I'm going to somewhere to write like the library or uh, a friend's cabin or something like that. And I have this, this with me. And I just love this. Uh, and it's nice to take a break, get your eyes, give your eyes a break from the screen and look up a definition to something uh, in a physical dictionary. Also the source right here as well. This is the same one from sixth grade as well. So I like having physical dictionaries, physical thesauruses to go through um, as I am writing. So that is close by as well, right there. Uh, a notebook, always have a notebook. I like larger notebooks like this. I got this one from SIG. Uh, I got a few of them a few years back. Uh, I think this might be my last one though. So I might have to find uh, this one's just pretty robust so it can handle the travel and in the backpack and all the rest of it pens attached and each book gets its own notebook typically more than one because I'll have different sizes of notebooks depending on where I'm going and and what I'm doing uh, you can go to officialjackcar.com hit shop and there's a cool leather bound one that uh, you can get that's uh, about half the size of this uh, for writing down different ideas so I always have a notebook going as well and what else? Emails to myself. So I, I've tried having the uh, notebook next to the bed, but uh, even though I said there, I have multiple, uh, which I do, uh, for whatever reason, in the middle of the night, it's just harder for me to wake up or as I'm going to bed, have an idea and to throw my legs over the side and, and write it down. I've done that a little bit, but then the next morning I look at it and I can't really tell what I wrote sometimes. So I'll grab my phone and I was trying to keep the phone out of the bedroom for years and I was successful for years, but I do have it down, uh, not right next to the bed. So I do have to get out of bed, go over to the plug where it's charging and then I'll send myself an email. So I'll send myself an email to an email address. That's only for me that nobody else has. Um, and I'll write the idea down. So then in the morning it's legible and it's there in the inbox on the computer that I just use for writing. So that's the other thing. I have a computer. This one is for, uh, for business and personal and everything else. And then I also have a computer right here. It is just for writing. So the only reason that this is connected to the internet is so that it can, I can send myself those emails and so that Word will update because I, I write in Word typically. So um, separate computer that is just for writing. That's to minimize those distractions. And I know that when I open this, it's time to write. There's no other things popping up, no FaceTime, no messages, no emails uh, from anybody else, nothing like that. This is just to write. So uh, that has worked out well for me and every book gets its own computer as well. Uh, uh, I use Scrivener. So and it is S C R I V E N E R. And that's from literature and latte.com. And I use that for book three and it's a writing program. Looks very similar to word used it for book three, Savage son. And what's great about it is that you can arrange your chapters in a way that you can drag and drop them. So instead of having to copy and paste like you do in Word, well, I can hit a button and all of the chapters go up and I can say, oh, you know what, chapter eight should really be chapter five and I can just drag it over. And you can set it up so that each one of those chapters has either uh, a couple lines that tell you what that chapter is about, or you can have it show the first few lines of that chapter. So you're like, oh, I remember that one. That should go over here. So you can drag and drop. So very helpful. You can also drag in research. So you can drag in photos. You can drag in websites. So instead of going on, say, if you're in Word, and maybe you can do that on Word. I just don't know how to do it. But uh, instead of going, oh, what was that website where I researched that town in Italy and I want to look at some photos of a shop and where was that again? And you're going back in your history and you're trying to find that exact photo that you maybe used a couple weeks earlier or a month earlier or whatever. Well, in this literature and latte Scrivener program, it's right there. You have it in attached to the chapter that you're writing under the research portion. So it's absolutely fantastic. I still don't know why I only used it for book three and it's easily converted to word as well. So you can convert it goes into word because in publishing, or at least my publisher reads things in word. So I would need to convert it in order to send it to them, but it's a fantastic program. I probably just scratched the surface. They had, I watched every video that they had little tutorials uh, and they were was fantastic, really user friendly. Uh, but for whatever reason, I went back to, to word. I think it's just because there's so much going on, anything that I can, uh, do to kind of speed things up. Um, 
uh, that's what I did. So I'm back in back in Word, um, but I probably should be working in that Scrivener program because once again, I had a great experience with it. So if you're uh, if you're starting out, it might not be a bad thing to explore. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, what else? Oh, also with those two computers, I write in a different area than I do any of the business stuff. So I have a separate place to write for whatever reason. For me, that's part of my process and that works. I can't sit down for whatever reason in the same place. Well, I can, but I don't like to sit down in the same place where I'm returning emails or doing personal stuff, doing some business stuff, doing some podcast stuff, whatever it might be. Uh, and then just pull up Word or even switch computers in the same spot. For whatever reason, I have to go to a different room to write. So now I have a place where I where I do that or a different place. Like I used to go to the library and write in one of their study rooms, um, go to friends' cabins, go to some place different where I minimize the interruptions, minimize those distractions, and know that it's just time to be 100% devoted to writing. So, uh, so I do do that as well. So once I do that, that outline, that manuscript, and uh, I get it, get to the end, well, then I print it. Because for whatever reason, I find more when I go through something in a physical copy than I do reading it on a screen. And I don't know why that is. That's just how it goes. So um, I take this down to uh, off, was Office Depot or Staples or something, and I have them put together a little binding right here, a little clear cover right here, a little plastic thing on the back. So I make it in kind of a little, a little book, and then I go someplace else, not where I write, not where I do the business, but to another business side of the house, but go to another room in the house, and I sit down, and I go through it with my red pen. So I try to experience it the way a reader would experience it for the first time. So I try to put myself in that mind frame, uh, or the mindset of just enjoying it as a reader, but I'm taking notes, I'm scribbling, I'm, I'm uh, Xing things out, I'm moving things around. So I go through it like that, then I go back, go back to the computer, take those changes from my read through that I've made changes with my red pen here, and I put those into the electronic document in Word, and then I do it again, print it out again, take it back once again, go through with my red pen, experiencing it the way that a reader would, and then make those changes on the computer right here that I use just for writing. And then I send it to four trusted agents. So for the first book, I sent it, I must have sent it to like 30 people. Um, and uh, now I send it to four people, four trusted agents that I know will read it and give me uh, honest feedback on it. Uh, and I'll send it to my mom and dad. So I sent it to six people, uh, I guess there, but, uh, send it out to those trusted agents, uh, get, get it back. And I don't always take their advice, but if like all of them said that something needs to change, then I would change that. If one of them says something, not the others, or if one or two of them say something, and I've been thinking in my head that maybe this needs to change or, uh, then, okay, that confirms that I need to make those changes or at least relook at it um, and give it, a, give, it another, give it another look. Uh, so I do that. It, uh, it comes back. I incorporate changes or not from, uh, from those recommendations from those four trusted agents. And then I send it off to my publisher and editor, Emily Bessler at Emily Bessler Books, which is an imprint of Atria and Simon and & Schuster. Uh, and she is just fantastic. She reads it. She gives me her notes. And then I take those notes go through, uh, make changes or respond to those, uh, uh, to those notes that she has, send it back to her. We go back and forth, uh, three times, typically sometimes a little more if I'm, if I think something else needs a little bit more refinement or I want to add something, or as I've read it over and over again, um, over this past month or two, uh, I realize that something either needs to come out or go in, uh, more commonly. So, so we do that and then it's done and off it goes to turn into to the book. Uh, also, as I'm writing, I get ideas for the next novel or one three down the line or four down the line. So I'm taking notes also there and I have a folder on the computer that I just write on that's future book ideas and uh, I have one that's say, hey, this is the one that I think is gonna be the one that I develop next. So I'm doing that at the same time right there. And that's pretty much the process. Uh, a lot of coffee, a lot of black, black raffle coffee in the morning, uh, and then bourbon at night. Uh, I don't want to switch those up. If you switch those up, maybe there's, there's an issue. So stick to coffee in the morning, bourbon at night. And then I also like to have weapons nearby for whatever reason. I mean, 
have weapons nearby anyway, but weapons that uh, have something to do with the novel. So I have something like this tomahawk right here or a pistol or whatever else it might be and have that close by as well. It's just nice to have books, research, dictionary, thesaurus, weapons, my computer that's just for writing, and that is is the process. Uh, now, once again, if you want some writing advice, there's another video that I made that is out there. You can check that out. It's about 15 minutes long. And this was my process. Hopefully it helps you. And in the end, you really just have to sit down and put pen to paper, put fingers to that keyboard and get to work. Thanks so much.